Okay, Apostle, so I know people have been scrolling and they are seeing this thing called Collide. What is Collide? Man, Collide is about my favorite time of the year. It's where pastors and their staffs come in from across the nation and we talk about the collision between structure and spirit. We talk about the necessity of building a church that has great structure, great connect groups, great opportunities for people to get involved, great family ministries, all those different things. But we also bring that part that is so necessary, the move of the Holy Spirit. So it's that collision between structure and spirit. And it's a time of impartation. It's a time of information. I would encourage you to come and be a part of it. We have eight campuses now from the heart of this Calvary campus in Ormond, where this is our philosophy and we're seeing multitudes changed by structure and spirit. Love for you to be a part of it. It's going to be a mighty time. Come on, let's praise the Lord, everybody. All right, precious, stand for the reading of God's word. That is my custom. I love the Lord today. How many of you love him? I'm a lover of his presence, and I don't apologize for that reality. We're in our REAP series. We have more vision than we've ever had. The last 25 years, God has been good, but I want to echo what the song says. Our best days are in front of us, not behind us. On Sacred Sunday, we had 500 more people just on this campus in our services than we had just one year ago. Our church is exploding in growth. That Sunday, we had between four and 5,000 people that worship just in our Florida campuses, not counting all of our campuses across the nation. How many of you are glad to be in a church that's making an impact across the nation? And I can tell you that with everything within me, I want to be in the present tense of God. I don't want to be where God was, and I don't even want to get ahead of Him. But I want to walk in cadence with the Lord. This series is called REAP. And REAP stands for revival. How many of you want revival with apostle? Evangelism. Assimilation, that means we're going to make disciples and then prayer. And all of that naturally flows together in a church that's in revival because when you have revival, there's evangelism. When there's evangelism, there's assimilation. But prayer is the bedrock of all of it. So today I'm going to teach one more time on revival. I want to hear from the people who are ready for revival. Come on, are you ready? I'm going to read one verse today, and then I'm just going to unpack this, and I want you to open your hearts. I've been with the Lord, and I believe he has a word for you. God, Habakkuk 3, 2, I've heard what our ancestors say about you, mom and them, grandma and them. I've heard what our ancestors say about you, and I'm stopped in my tracks. I'm down on my knees do among us what you did among them come on somebody work among us as you worked among them send a revival of your works how many of you want him to send a revival of miracles signs and wonders as you bring judgment as you surely must in wrath, remember mercy. How many of you want mercy today? I want to preach for a few minutes along these lines. Atmospheres of revival. Who wants to be in an atmosphere of revival? Slip up your hands, Father. Let the anointing come in here as I preach and teach. Let this atmosphere be charged with revival. God, show us, teach us, guide us in this process of hearing your voice and do among us what you did among the early church. Pour out revival and we'll give you praise. Somebody give the Lord the ovation of the morning. Come on. If you're revival ready, come on and give him praise right now. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. God, I've heard of what our ancestors say about you, and I'm stopped dead in my tracks, down on my knees. Do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you worked among them. 
Send a revival of your works as you bring judgment as you surely must. In wrath, remember mercy. I'm glad for a merciful God. Is there anybody here today only because of the mercy of God? I'm looking for the people who don't even deserve to be in the room. But you're here because of God's mercy. Can I find two or three in the house today? Many of you know the mission of our church. We exist to pursue revival, to build unity, to release purpose, and to leave legacy. I've taught that, and that's really the direction of this house. But make no mistake about it. First and foremost, we pursue revival. And no matter how much we grow, no matter how many traffics or no matter how many campuses we start, if there are traffic jams trying to get into our campuses, if we have 700 people saved to service, I want you to understand that we will never stop pursuing revival. Because if I have studied revival in the recent days, I've come to understand that the only time revival ever stopped happening when there were major moves of the Holy Spirit was when other things came to the forefront and people began to pursue titles or opportunities. They began to pursue stages. And in those moments, revival stopped. But I have made up in my mind that Calvary, everything we cover, we are going to perpetually pursue revival and awakening. Is there anybody there? And you say, Apostle, I'll do that with you. I'll pursue revival. If that's you, lift up a praise before the Lord right now. The text that we just read in Habakkuk is so powerful. And really, if you study the book of Habakkuk, the first couple of chapters is just a conversation between the prophet and between God. The nation here is in trouble, and Habakkuk is prophesying of the coming invasion of the Babylonians. He's troubled because Judah in his lifetime had enjoyed such a time of revival and favor. They had a righteous king named Josiah, but suddenly things shifted and things changed. And now the nation has slipped into lethargy and compromise and sin and adultery. And Habakkuk sees the favor of the Lord lifting off of his nation. And he knows that judgment is coming. And so much so, he realizes it so amazingly and so intensely that at the end of our verse, he knows that judgment is coming and his hearts cry because he loves his nation. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. He said, even though we may deserve wrath, just remember that you have a remnant, that you still have a people within a people. And the reality is that Habakkuk is trying in this moment to understand the ways of God because God is about to use the Babylonians to bring judgment to Judah. And this prophet who has this eagle eye and sees it coming in the spirit, he tries to understand why are you using the Babylonians to judge us? Because they're more wicked than we are. Why are you using them to judge us? Because they have more problems than we have. And that tells me two things. Number one, don't judge somebody because they sin differently than you do. Oh, it's quiet in here. Where's all the things are going to change people that was just having church with me? Isn't it funny how we look at our issues with a telescope, but we look at other people's issues with a microscope? Come on, somebody. And you don't need to judge someone because they sin differently than you do. But the second thing you've got to take from this is the fact that God judges his people differently. God did not hold the Babylonians responsible to the level that he held the Jewish people responsible because there is a, there is a responsibility that comes to those who have a knowledge and an understanding of God. So God will require more of his church than he does of the world. And there are things that the world can get by with that you and me can't get by with because we know too much about the Lord. Come on, somebody. So here Habakkuk is. He, he sees this incredible swing in the atmosphere of Judah. They go from an atmosphere of revival 
and power and goodness and grace to suddenly, if you read the the book of Habakkuk, you find out there's trouble, there's plundering, there's violence, there's strife, there's compromise, there's contention, there's perversion, there's unfairness, there's unequitable judgment. Sounds a lot like America. Come on, somebody. Habakkuk saw trouble and sin everywhere, and the whole world seemed to be broken down. And this man who knew revival is now hungry for God to revive them again. He said, Lord, now we're just surviving, but I want you to take our nation from survival to revival. And it was from this place of personal prophetic visitation and a desperate desire for revival that Habakkuk penned the words, God, I've heard what our ancestors say about you. And I'm stopped down, I'm stopped in my tracks and I'm down on my knees. He said, do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you worked among them. Send revival to your works, oh God. How many of you can say, I'm right there with you, apostle. I want God to do among us what he did among the early church. I want there to be outpourings. I want there to be cities burning in revival. I want to see families saved. I want to see bodies healed. I want to see young people transformed. I want to see families put back together. I want to see miracles and wonders. Is there anybody that can say, God, that's what I want do among us? What can he do with y'all? I said, can he do it? Give him praise if you're hungry for it just like that. He's longing, he's longing for revival now to fall again on his nation. Even though they were broken down as a people, he knew the same God that rained down judgment could rain down revival. If he could find a hungry people, he is asking the God of wonders to be that God again. He's asking that miracle worker to do miracles again. He understood anything that God ever was, he ever is. And anything God could ever do, he could do again. He wanted revival. He was only satisfied with revival. Nothing else would do. He wanted an awakening. He wanted a move of God. And in that desperation, he said, that's all I'll settle for is a move of God. And I'm telling you, I stand before you today. And I just had my birthday. And y'all know that I'm not as young as I was, but I'm not all that old. Come on somebody but the reality of it all is this I want revival today more than I've ever wanted it in my life I want awakening today more than I've ever wanted it in my life I want this house to burn and everything to be covered to burn like I've never wanted it in my life and what I need is a people who will rise with me and say apostle I want to get in that pursuit with you It's in that atmosphere of desperation that he begins to cry out for revival because he had tasted it before and now nothing else will do. John Kilpatrick led the greatest revival of my generation. Many of you know about the Brownsville revival. It literally shook our nation. I was sitting with Pastor John Kilpatrick And that revival was led by him as the pastor and apostle. But there was an evangelist named Steve Hill who was a Teen Challenge graduate who did not seem like he would have been the obvious choice to lead a revival like that. But God had delivered him, saved him, sanctified him, brought him out of drug addiction and set him on the largest stage in the world at that moment. And there was an outpouring of revival. And I say, God, do among us what you did among them. And I sat with John Kilpatrick several months ago at Seasons 52 in Orlando him and a young person who had been in that revival. And I say a young person in her 30s, she was in kids' church when that revival hit. 
And it was about 3.30 or 4, they finally brought the kids in. And that's the first Sunday that it poured out. And they both began to weep. They were trying to talk about it. And the girl said, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And John Kilpatrick starts trying to talk to me and starts weeping profusely. And then he said these words. He said, once you tuck your knees under the table of revival, he said, nothing else will do. Once you tuck your knees under a table where there's glory and power and presence and outpouring, he said, you can't ever go back to just religion. You can't ever go back to just denominationalism. Is there anybody here that can say, God, I'm ready for an outpouring just like that? If that's you, give the Lord a radical praise right now. As I've studied revivals of the past most recently, they all point to certain things and they all have, for lack of a better term, certain heat signatures. There's things that occurred during this, these revivals. In the 1730s and the 1740s, there occurred a revival called the Great Awakening. And this revival was led here in America by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. It was a revival, y'all, that was ignited by young people. Teenagers and young adults got desperate for God and their hunger swept the nation and even went into Europe and it caused an awakening. Then in 1857, there was a man in New York City who started praying every day at noon for revival, a businessman. And he prayed by himself. And then all of a sudden, men began to come until there were 10,000 men a day in New York City who were bowing their knees and crying out for revival. It brought such a move of God that revival swept the nation. And they said that there were cities that had a thousand percent increase in church attendance. When you compare the size of the population from those days to this day, it would be like 36 million people came to Jesus in that revival where men prayed. I wonder if there's anybody ready to see revival that gives us tens of millions of people coming into the kingdom in a mighty way. Now, we've always known for centuries that the women with their nurturing hearts and their willingness to intercede and their sensitivity to the Holy Spirit have really been the glue in many cases that have held the church together. Can I get a witness from honest folk? How about the church mothers that kept praying? Y'all, I dare you right now to thank God for the women that held on for the men, even when the men were going crazy. It's true that women interceded. So we see a revival then where young people are there. And then later we see a revival that swept the nation where men seem to rise up and shake off the constraints and shake off the preconceived ideas of what a man would be and they got desperate to intercede. But then in 1906, there was an outpouring at Azusa Street. Here in Black History Month, it's a good time to remember that the man who led the revival that brought the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was an African-American man. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all know God pours his spirit out and uses whoever he wants to? And an African-American man and a white man came together, a white man named Parham, and they came together and began to pray. And God used William Seymour, and he stepped out and led this revival. And what shocked the nation was that it was all different races of people that were coming together for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. 
many of y'all know that when God pours his spirit out, he pours it out on all flesh. So God used this great and mighty bishop to bring an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what happened, where there is revival, there's increase. And where there's revival, new things happen and new churches start. And when there was an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in 1906, nobody even knew anything about Pentecost. Nobody in America even knew much about the outpouring. But now, if you look across the world, more than one-third of the church is now Pentecostal. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the power of God. In Africa, half the church is Pentecostal. The fastest growing part of the church now is Pentecostal because when there's revival, churches start and outpourings come. How many of you are ready for a multicultural revival? So last Sunday, y'all know what happened. It got undone in this house. It got a little bit crazy. And I don't know if you noticed, but over here were young people. In fact, just show that clip. All them young people. Now watch this. All them men, men on the stage, and then you look, red, yellow, black, and white on the stage. Look at the men, look at the young people, look at the diversity. Okay, that's good. So watch this. I said, Lord, do among us what you did among them. Can't you roll it all up and bring us young people and multicultural people and men and let's have revival like we ain't never seen it before. If you're ready for revival just like that, open your mouth and give God a praise. So, when I saw that, and then I studied, oof, I said, devil, you're in trouble now. Because we got all different kinds of people who are part of this ministry. And then you got young people on the stage dancing. They ain't in, the, in the club. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all know revival is greater than razzles? Can I get a witness in the house? I said revival is greater than razzles, huh? Come on, I'd rather be in the church than the club. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all young people say, I, listen, when I got saved, I didn't quit dancing. I just changed partners. Can I get a witness in this house? And then I looked at the multicultural part. And then I looked at the men. And I'm saying, Lord, is it true? Could you right here in Ormond Beach, could you do among us what you did among them? I'm just wondering, is there anybody that's ready to see that kind of revival? If you are, give the Lord a praise. I'm going to teach through a couple things. And then we're going to see what God does. Somebody say atmospheres of revival. How many of y'all want to be in an atmosphere of revival? That's what you want to, to come to church in and be a part of. Number one, an atmosphere of revival is full of prayer. God at times puts a longing into people's hearts, so much so that many begin to pray for revival. And that's what's going on at Calvary. We've been calling prayer meetings. We've just come out of a fast. Our, our staff is praying at another level in a new dimension. I can't even describe it to you. In fact, this Wednesday, we're fasting and we're meeting at 12. This Tuesday, we're fasting and meeting at 12 in the youth chapel. If you'd like to come and we're going to be praying for revival. But understand, as I said in 1857, this revival that came among men, it came because men prayed. And I want to tell you, we need to pray like we've never needed to pray before. 
We need to seek the face of God like we've never sought the face of God before. It's time to pray. Our nation needs prayer. Come on, somebody. I said our college campuses need prayer. Our high schools need prayer. Our children need prayer. Our churches need prayer. Our government needs prayer. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Our cities need prayer. There are some things that don't shift till you pray. There are some things that don't turn till you pray. But when you pray, things start happening. Is there anybody interested in prayer today? The Bible said in Psalm 69, 13, but as for me, the psalmist said, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear in the truth of your salvation. Here's what the psalmist said. He said, my prayer is to you. He, he said, I, I'm coming to you, God. In times of revival, you pray. In times of revival, you acknowledge that you can't deal with it yourself. In times of revival, you say, I see a world so lost. I see a nation so jacked up. I'm, come on, somebody. Church folks are still sitting around fussing about whether you're singing hymns or choruses, and we got young people that don't know whether they're a him or a her. Come on, somebody. We need to get that mess off the table and get revival back to the front and begin to pray. Ah. Come on, somebody. It's time to pray. It's an acknowledgement. He said, my prayer is to you. It was, the, it was in, in essence, the psalmist was saying, I can't fix this. I can't repair this. I can't put this back together. So my prayer is to you. It's time to pray, y'all. Because here's what I know. Prayer still works. I need somebody who's ever had God answer a prayer in your life. Stop right now and give him praise. Come on, I need a church that's not ashamed to call on Jehovah for your children. Give the Lord praise if you believe prayer still works. I am a product of prayer. Wave at me if you are a product of prayer today. I am a product of prayer and not my own, honey. I mean, I've been sustained by my own prayer and God's been good. But if, when I was lost and undone, honey, when I was jacked up and messed up, there were people who prayed for me. And I'm telling you, the same God that got me out can get anybody that's in a mess out. It's time to pray. So then, so number one, there's prayer. But then he said this in the text. He said, oh Lord, and the acceptable time. In the time of your favor, one translation said. I wonder if there's anybody here who needs the favor of the Lord. Okay, watch this. Number one, there's prayer. Number two, there's something called timing. Revival is all about timing. Revival uh, often occurs in times of moral and spiritual apathy in the church and immorality in the land. It is the iniquity. It is the sin, y'all, that makes people ready to pray. And when I look at my nation, America is ripe for revival. Now, y'all know I travel somewhere almost every week. One of the places that I preach frequently is L.A. So when I'm flying, when I preach in, the, in Los Angeles proper, I fly into LAX, and I just read that now in LAX, in the women's bathroom, they have now installed urinals. Y'all ain't saying a word to me. I'm telling you, who wants your six-year-old daughter to walk into a bathroom where a man is standing at a urinal. Y'all help me, Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach it whether you amen me or not. I'm tired of the politically correct, limp-wristed preacher that will not stand up and take the Bible and preach it.
We've got transvestites in the pulpit. We let them talk to our children at the library. Where are the pastors that will stand up and say it's time for revival? I am shocked. Is anybody still shocked when you hear something like that? I am shocked. And if it's ever been time for revival, it's time for revival right now. I don't hate nobody. Come on, somebody. I love everybody, everybody. But let me tell you something. I, I'm gonna mess. I'm gonna mess y'all up. I'm. I'm gonna y'all. If you want to email me, my, my email is Anderson at CalvaryFL.com. Come on. People go on Google, they'll eat. He, he don't love people. He talked to you. Ah, we were there. He, you, I can't believe what he said. You go ahead and say that. I don't care. I ain't worried about Google. I'm worried about God. I love everybody. But do you remember that Sunday, honey, when you preached on the blood and this man came forward, but he was dressed like a woman? And he were pretty, remember? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Girls, you, you need a man. If you're outside and in a conversation with a man, and at some point he's talking and he goes, that is not your man. Y'all, I'm preaching better you're letting on. If, if he's in a conversation at some point, he, he's talking and he does his chest like this. That is not your man. Come on, somebody. If he gets scared and he takes off running and his elbows are touching, that is not your man. Come on. I'm ready for some men that know how to be men that will stand up and be a man in front of this generation. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm on it now. See, that's what happens when revival comes. When revival comes, people gain their true identity and they know who they are. Do you remember? Honey, you preached on the blood and and that man came forward and got straight up delivered. I'm talking about, I'm talking about threw up. I, that's too much for y'all religious folk. I'm talking about delivered, but he came back the next Sunday and we found out that his name was Prince. That was his real name. The one Sunday he came, he was a princess. The next Sunday he was a prince and he stayed in my church for years and he's serving Jesus today. I'm trying to tell you God can still do it. Wound up being a handsome man. Come on. You say, well, I Apostle America's in trouble. Here's what I know. When the world is at its worst, God's church must be at its best. If you want to step in the timing of God with me, give God a praise right now. See, we operate on deadlines, appointments, and obligations, but God don't struggle with any of that, y'all. God does not respond to our deadlines. He doesn't respond to our, to our appointments or obligations. What God responds to is hunger. What God responds to is desperation. Revival is stepping into the divine timing of the Lord, brought about by His sovereignty and our hunger. It's when the sovereignty of God 
and the hunger of the church collide. So is there anybody hungry with apostle today? Are you ready to step into the timing of God? So the third thing, I'm moving quickly. In an atmosphere of revival is there is miracle mercy. That means conviction becomes very real. Sin and compromise are dealt with. The church repents. And the cold church gets on fire. And then sinners come to Jesus. Have you ever been in an atmosphere, especially in the old days, where so much conviction would come into the house until a whale would hit the room, until a weep would hit the room? And it would be like sinners are inconsolable without the Lord. And I've asked the Lord to do it again. I've asked the Lord to create atmospheres at Calvary where I don't even get to give the altar call, where people are so hungry to repent. Are you ready for miracle mercy in the house? When I was growing up, we used to sing this song out of the Red Back Hymnal. Some of y'all know about that old hymn book. And that old song said, yes, I know, yes, I know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Yes, I know, yes, I know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Oh, I better sing that again, just in case you get a little bit uppity. Just in case you don't think so-and-so deserves to be here. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Yes, I know. I truly know. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. So if I believe that, here's my announcement. If you're addicted to drugs, come to my church. If you're an alcoholic, come to my church. If you're a fornicator, oh, it's quiet in here. Come to my church. If you're bound by sexual sin, come to my church. All you liars, come on in. All you prideful folk, come on in. I ain't scared of none of y'all. There is a gospel that will change. We love you. Come on in. We're here for you. Come on in. If you want everybody to come for Miracle Mercy, give God a praise. In atmospheres of revival, drug dealers get saved. Mm. One night when I was a young evangelist, you remember this, Don? I haven't thought about this in decades. We brought people forward, and I was praying for folk. And this woman, I laid hands on her. She said, pray for my son. He's the biggest drug dealer in town. And I'm laying hands on her. And in the spirit, I'm saying, you got to come, son. You got to come into this place. We call the biggest drug dealer in town. We call him in. I'm praying for his mama, and the back doors swing open, and the boy, you remember? The boy came walking in and ran to the altars and said, I don't even know why I'm here. I was driving by the church, and I heard something in the car say, you better go in there, you better get it right, right now. I need somebody who wants it like that. My God, if you want it like that, give the Lord a praise in here. So revival has miracle mercy attached to it. But the fourth thing, revival is messy. Uh-huh. We want it to be cute, don't we? But a revival church ain't a cute church. Y'all know that by now at Calvary. Y'all know we get some stuff at Calvary. It's messy. We bring folk in who are struggling and we're glad to have them. Come on now. We, we want folks in who have problems and we're glad to have them. 
It's messy. It's not cute. But I'm telling you, I don't care what people look like. I don't care what they smell like. I don't care how many, come on now. Let, let me tell you, I'm glad to be at Calvary. I don't care how many tattoos you got. I don't care how, some people, y'all y'all piercing everything. You're piercing your nose, you're piercing your ears, you're piercing everything. <laughs> piercing your ears, I'm gonna tell you me, I'm going out with the same number of holes I came in with, that's just me. But I'm telling you, I don't care if you got tattoos. I don't care if you're addicted. I don't care if you're messed up. I don't care if you're struggling. Come on in this place, hallelujah. There is a great redeemer in this house. And there are times in revival where you must get comfortable being uncomfortable. And then, and then there are manifestations. Well, apostle, she got baptized in the Holy Ghost. She got weird. Tell somebody, lay your hands on her. She got weird. Listen, she was weird before she was ever filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't you blame the Holy Ghost on that. Holy Ghost didn't have nothing to do with that. Come on, somebody. But in revival, you're going to see things. In, in every major revival, even in the 1700s, they trembled. They couldn't stand. They fell out. They, they could not stand in the presence of the Lord. It happened in every major revival. At Brownsville, they shook. I remember when I went there, young people were trembling. The power of God was so intense. And yes, there were excesses. Yes, there were people who got in the flesh, but you got in the flesh just this week. You just wasn't in church. When you cussed your son out, you got in the flesh. When you shot that person a bird on the road, y'all ain't saying nothing now. You got in the flesh. When you watched that on TV, you got in the flesh. Where's a real folk at now? But now you're going to judge everybody because, hey, listen, they in the flesh. Listen, we're going to have folk who will get in the flesh. Well, aren't you afraid, apostle? They're going to get in the flesh, and they're going to have manifestations that are in the flesh. Aren't you afraid of that? Do you want that, apostle? And I say a thousand times yes. I'm fine with people who struggle, and maybe they go too far because I tell you this, it's much easier to tone down a fanatic than it is to resurrect a corpse. I said it's easier to tone down a fanatic than it is to resurrect the corpse. It's messy, and there are manifestations. But somebody raise your hands and say it with me. Say, Lord, we want revival. It's messy. There are excesses. People act a little crazy. But revival bears fruit. Look at Azusa Street. Everything you see in here, the Pentecostal experience, the multicultural house, is all the way back to Bishop Seymour and the revival that he led on Azusa Street in California. Almost one-third of the Christian world, now beyond one-third, is now spirit-filled. The largest churches in the world are full gospel churches. The biggest church in the world is in North Korea. They have over a million people, I think, now coming. It's a Holy Ghost-filled church. It's the fastest growing part of God's church. Every, every other part seems to be receding. But the Pentecostal church that was birthed in revival is taking ground. I think about the people. Elijah, is your mom and dad here? Where, where y'all at? Some of my favorite. Stand up, daddy. Hey, did you get saved at Brownsville? Your wife got saved. And y'all, you guys are a product, and your, your son, stand up son, is a product of the Brownsville Revival. I need somebody to give God praise right now. 
when I look at you, Brother Tate, I look at your wife, and I look what the Lord has done, <laughs> and it makes you believe in revival, don't it? It makes you know that it doesn't matter how addicted you are or how messed up you are. When God gets ready to bring revival, he'll bring it. Hallelujah. So the last thing before I have Pastor Dawn come up, and we're going to pray a little bit. I've gone a little bit long, but that's okay. Because your neighbor has been so mean this week. Yeah, look down at him and say, yeah, he knows your business. Come on. God doesn't operate on our time schedules. We opened up and let the Holy Spirit move in that worship service. How many of y'all glad that we did? Come on. But finally this. Revival, they say, as you study revivals of the past, they're cyclical. What does that mean? That means they have a start, they rise, they crest, they diminish, and then they go out. And that's the revivals that I've studied. But in boldness, I have now asked the Lord to do something different for me. In humility, I've asked the Lord to Jesus tarry for a generational revival. I've asked the Lord, don't let me miss it. But don't let my children not see it. So I've asked the Lord for something to hit our ministries that will cause us to burn in perpetual revival. That for the next years, as Apostle leads this house and leads our campuses, that we will burn in revival, but sons and daughters will rise up and our hearts will remain pure. Ah. And our motives will remain right. For 20 years from now, we will burn in the greatest revival that it will only increase to Jesus' tarry. Is there anybody that believes that we can burn in perpetual revival until Jesus returns? The early church experienced revival for 300 years be specific, 290 years from the time that Christ was resurrected and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came and the early church burned in revival for centuries and then Constantine, the Roman emperor, accepted salvation and led the Roman Empire into a Christ-centered worship problem was that on the heels of that the Roman Catholic Church was formed and, and listen there are a lot of good Catholic people but the reality of it all in those days it became about religion it became about titles it became about positions <laughs> and that revival went out so much so that that season after that was called the dark ages come on somebody because religion killed revival. But for hundreds of years, it went from generation to generation to generation to generation. I need somebody right now who will stand to your feet and say, Apostle, I want that kind of revival that will go from generation to generation.
to generation. If that's what you want, give God a praise right now. The word Habakkuk means to embrace. It means to hang on. And I want to ask you, who's ready to be a Habakkuk with me in your generation? Who's ready to hang on to God with all your spiritual might until revival doesn't just come, revival stays. Remember what the prophet said. He said, in wrath, remember mercy. In atmospheres where God pours out revival in the midst of wickedness in that very moment, he is remembering mercy. I want every young person that's called to preach, get up here right now. Every young person, you know I'm called to preach. I'm called to preach. Get up here right now. Come stand right here. I know I'm called, apostle. I know I'm called. I need you, I need, I need the people to rejoice right now. You're an evangelist, right? That's it on the stage. I'm gonna wait, 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 I'm gonna wait. If you know I'm called, I'm called to preach, preach it. I need I, I need radical folk. Don't judge it. Don't try to figure it out. Just say if they want it, I want it for them. Give God a praise right now. Tell me your name, Mark. Okay. You're traveling the nation right now, aren't you? Give me a microphone. You're preaching revivals right now, and God's using you. Mark. I'm telling you, son. Are you? Are, what? What brought you here today? You came to receive. This dude right here. You, you, you follow me on Instagram or something, right? I'm watching this dude be used to shift atmospheres and to change his generation. I'm looking at a revivalist right here. Son, let me tell you, God's going to use you to shift a generation. God, He's using you now, but you have not even seen anything yet. There is an awakening coming. Hallelujah. I prophesy that there is an awakening coming. And God is putting you at the forefront. God has held you. There were opportunities that you had. There were doors that tried to open and you said, that ain't my door because I know I'm not called to that. There were relationships that you could have got in that you didn't get in because you said, that ain't my door. But God said, get ready. He's about to bring revival and awaken your generation. I release over. Listen, God, the mantle that you've had on me, I put that mantle on him in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, I want you to take 60 seconds and pray in the Holy Ghost. Revival, 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 revival. Come here, John. I feel it in my bones. You're about to move. I feel it in the wind. You're about to ride in. I feel it in my bones. You're about to move. Somebody raise your hands right now. I 
breakers anointing on you if somebody met you privately they wouldn't even know what you carry because you are soft-spoken you are actually a little bit inside of yourself sometimes but when you stand on the stage something comes on you and there is a breakers anointing the Lord said Jacob he is releasing on you a powerhouse anointing that you will shift your generation into a move of God. Somebody, come on. I'm about to come out and pray for people right now. what I see the enemy doing he's been trying to distract you but the Lord said that there is an anointing a generational anointing that has come to you son and the enemy has tried to pull you here and pull you there and pull you out of your call but I hear the Lord say if you will focus everything that you have that God will use you in ways you never dreamed or imagined I call you a man of God. I call you a man of the word. I call you a preacher. I release Rabbi. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody give God a praise. I'm going to minister to young people for just a minute. Raise your hands. Did I text you this morning? What did I call you? Prophet. I, I, I need you to say it real loud. What did I call you? Prophet. I called you prophet, didn't I? I texted you on Instagram. And I called you prophet. And I'm going to tell you you are more, son. I'm going to tell you that you are more. I'm going to tell you that God will reveal the invisible to you if you will serve him with all your might. If you will prepare yourself, he will put something on you that is supernatural. It is time. I don't know why I had to text you this morning. I don't know why I had to reach out with you this morning, but I feel a pull. It's like you've been being pulled out of your purpose. You've been surrounding yourself with people that are trying to rob you of your destiny. you got to get that mind renewed. Prophet of God, I release the anointing on you right now. Somebody throw up your hands and say, I feel it. Raise your hands, Brother Hogue. Your daddy was our children's pastor and your mom. I don't know, 13 years, long time. And now they're doing foster care and adoption. But here's the deal. This next season has got to be purity for you. 
this next season, all the past is gone. And God is unlocking a purity to you. Man of your word. Man of truth. And the Lord said he's going to anoint you and put his hand on you. That you didn't wind up in that family by mistake. But you wound up in that family adopted because there was an anointing on your life. And I am releasing over you a new thing. I am releasing over you clarity. God anoint him for the glory of the Lord. Give God a praise. I'm not gonna lay hands on all y'all, but I need you right here. So here's what I see in you. You, you are smart. But the Lord said that you are a lay minister. He said, I've given you business acumen on one side. He said, but don't forget that I've got my hand on you. And the Lord said, there's more ministry in you than you know. And the Lord said, don't doubt anything that he will do for you. The Lord said, you carry the anointing of a king and a priest. Y'all, I feel a prophetic river in this house right now. I need the hungry people that ain't worried that it's 10 after 12. Open up your mouth and give God a praise. Raise your hands. So you have the anointing of a king and a priest. Do you understand what that means? That means you have the anointing for resources. You have the anointing for business. But the Lord said, you've also got the anointing for ministry. So the Lord said, you are not one dimensional, you are two. So the Lord said, get ready. You're going to step in the next five years into resources and revival. The Lord's going to use you in resources and revival. I release a glory over you, Landon, from the top of your head, to the soles of your feet, in the name of Jesus. Landon, this is Pastor John. How many of y'all love Pastor John? All right. Today at 8.30, this young man texted this young man and said, there's going to be glory in the house today. He didn't even know it was coming on him. All right, where are them two boys at? Come stand right here. I'm coming after you, girls. Y'all just hang. I ain't forgot none of y'all. You know what this is, Christian? This is your preacher posse. This boy, this boy, this boy, wherever Jacob is, this is your preacher posse. I said, this is your preacher posse. I said, this is your preacher posse. Preachers right here. Preachers right here. Preachers right here. I don't care where your family is or where you come out of. Son, you've been feeling it. You've been sensing it. Joey, I release an anointing on you. I call you a preacher in the neck of Rabba Caleb in the name of Jesus. Throw your hands in the air. 
Yadon's just taking a position where he's going, he's going to still be at church here, but he's been my assistant for four years. But now God has opened the door for him to become an evangelist in Latin America. And that's been his heart. So the Lord said for the last, how long have you been here? 11 years. You've been in school when you didn't even know it. You were learning the ebb and the flow of the Holy Spirit. The last four years you've been with me on the road, the Lord said you needed it personal. The Lord said I couldn't put you in a ministry because you would have been distant from the leader. So the Lord said I had to put you underneath a father because there were things that you had to catch because you were close. But now the Lord said there's a fire that's coming on you, son, and you will ignite everywhere you go with the power of God. I release revival in Latin America and I release a fire. Somebody say, I feel it in my bones. I mean the power of God came on you. But let me tell you something. I've never done this before. The Lord said you got boys. And the Lord said you love them boys. The Lord said them boys are your heart. But the Lord said there's ministry in them boys. There's purpose in them boys. The Lord said even if they're not acting it out right now, Mother in the name of Jesus, I'm calling them boys to rise. I'm calling them boys to rise. Hey, hey, hey. I need somebody to say, I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my bones. Oh, yeah. I feel it in the wind. say this to you, raise your hands. In the last six months, the enemy tried to blur your spiritual vision. And the reason he did it was because he could forecast this moment. He couldn't prophesy it. And he doesn't know the future. But he so understands the nature of humanity that he can see when God is about to do a thing. He knew that you were critical. Come up here, son, you. He knew that you were critical eh, to this outpouring that's going to hit your generation. And there are things that you are good at and things that you struggle in. And all you ever heard in your head, in your spiritual conversation, was the things that you could not do. The enemy constantly whispered to you, you cannot do it, you're not able, this is not you. You need to make a transition, you need to make a change. There's got no, this is what you're good at, this is a lane you need to be in. But God said, no, I took you through that season because I needed you to know that it wasn't your gifting or your skill or your ability. He said, I navigated you through that and then I put a partner with you who has the gift set that you don't have. And I hear the Lord say, together, you guys are about to change a generation in this house. I need some radical people that will get with me. There is going to be an awakening of salvation. There's going to be an awakening of power. But you're going to transfer to them what I transfer to you. I release clarity and a revival like it in the 1740s. Let it hit this generation in the name of Jesus.
Okay, I see creativity all in you. And the Lord said, you're going to be a, a creative evangelist. The Lord said, you're going to connect with your generation. I feel that in my bones. I've never said those words in my whole life. The Lord said, you're going to connect your generation with the glory to God. With the glory of God. You're going to connect your generation because you're going to be so relevant. But not only that, you're going to be real. So I release over you, son, an anointing like you have. That when you sit down to create, you're going to create, create underneath the anointing of the Holy Ghost. A creative evangelist in the name of Jesus. Now, we got to lay hands on these young people. What are you feeling? There, there, there's some, there are some girls. That's there's, what. There, there's some girls, and the Holy Ghost is about to come on you with His fire. I, I feel that there's some girls you you feel called to the ministry, but you don't know how to get started. You don't have you don't feel like you have what you need, but the Holy Ghost is going to hit you with His fire today. He's about to come on you and come in you with a fire. That's what I just kept hearing. I'm about, I'm going to pour my fire out upon some daughters that are hungry. They're hungry to serve me. They're hungry to preach. They're hungry to minister. And the fire is what's going to lead you. You say, well, I don't know what door I would go through. I don't even know how I would start. The Holy Ghost just made it plain before me that he was going to release his fire in you. And that fire in you was going to show you which way to go. He was just going to begin opening the doors for you. Your voice was going to be turned up. He was going to open the doors that you need to go through. And so there are, so where are the girls? Where are the daughters that say, I have that on me? Where are you? Where are you? You stand right up here. All the daughters. The we daughters, ain't forgot you, young man. I'm coming the daughters, to you. Those daughters, and you say, I'm, laying, I'm ready to lay it all down. I'm ready to lay it all down for him. I've got a desperation in me to be used by God. I feel his call on my life. I can't get away from it. It's in me. His hey, word is hey, like a fire that's shut up in my bones when I pray. I get overcome with the presence and the passion for my generation for God to use me. Oh, Give me this hallelujah. one right here. Give me this one. Bring that one to you. Bring that one up here on the stage. Bring her up on the stage. Bring her up on the stage. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Y'all, that's a preacher right there. That's a revivalist right there. Yeah, God, I go ahead. Fire of God. Now, now, real quick, where's Mark at? Come up here, Mark. Where's Pastor Christian? All right. I'm going to have you two. Because y'all are y'all carry that fire. As Pastor Don lays hands, because you're going to lay hands on your generation. I said, you're going to lay hands on your generation. Yeah. You're going to move your generation to Pentecost. You're going to move them to miracles and wonders. Don, you're going to lay hands on the boy, on the girls, and it's going to be fire. How many of you young men are here for the fire right now, you young ladies? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Go lay hands on the men. Go with him. You're done. Go with him. Come on.
can't make the mistake of rushing out of this. So if you want hands laid on you, you want somebody to pray over you, get up here right now. Whoever you are, if you want a new anointing, just get up here right now. We're going to move through. We're going to lay hands on people. If you want to slip out, you can. But we're going to let revival hit. I got to be on that plane at 4 o'clock. But I'm going to tell you, I feel like God wants to anoint people with fresh oil. I want that couple right there to come, my sweet people. Yeah, y'all, come on, come on, come on, man of God. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Come on up here to the front. You're done. Help them come up. So come on in. Come on in. All right, raise your hands. I hear the Lord say, these are ministry people, right? That's why you had to come to Calvary, because you're not only ministry people, you're revival people. And y'all don't play about it. Y'all are desperate for it. Hector, it's real for you. You're a man of God. You're a man of the Word. You're a man of power. Miriam, you're an anointed woman of God. But the Lord said that for me to tell you that your greatest days are not behind you. Don't look back and act like God is through. The Lord said he's going to use you in this house. And he's going to use you in this ministry. And you're going to lead a revival among your peers that's going to continually take people before the Holy Ghost. The Lord said you haven't seen anything yet. The Lord said the greatest glory is coming on you. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Now, Christian, I want you to move through and lay hands on people. Come on. I, Pastor Don, move through and lay hands on people. You Don, move through and lay hands on people. Come on. I need my preachers to move through and lay hands on people right now. Let's lay hands on folk. Hallelujah. Let's lay hands on folk. And now, hey, this ain't dismissed. Do whatever you want to do. But we're just going to have some time in the presence of the Lord. John, however you want to lead. Now, son, you lead. I'm in the altars. Go ahead. Hallelujah. This is revival.
I want this remnant that is left. What an unbelievable Sunday. Give the Lord a praise for it. Come on. I want everybody that's in your 20s or under to raise up your hands right now. Everybody that's in your 20s or under. Look at this. Uh, Christian, y'all better get ready. Tonight's going to be supernatural in young adults. Keep your hands up. Courtney, I want you to sing that over this generation. I don't see you bound. I don't see you sexually confused. I don't see you in bondage. I don't see you addicted. I don't see you messed up. I don't see you compromised. I don't see you fornicating. I don't see you bound by the enemy. Here's what I see. Raise up your hands and receive it. Sing it. I see you taking ground. I see you press ahead. Your power is dangerous to the enemy. Somebody stretch your hand toward this generation right now. You still do me You will do what you say. Everybody sing now. I see you take it. Sing it over this generation. I see you press ahead. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's king. You still do miracles. You will do what you said. For you're the same God now as you always Sing it again. I see this is you, generation. This is you. I see you press the red. Your power is dangerous to, to the enemy's camp. You, you will do miracles. You will do what? You will do what you say. Every young person, raise your, your hands. Now as you Somebody receive it right now. We're going to sing it one more time. Sing it over this generation. I see you taking rest. Oh, yes, I do. I see you press away. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's care. Hallelujah, Jesus. You still do me. You will do what you, you say. Moving in. Your kingdom's moving in. Your victory claims the ground that the enemy has. You still do miracles. You will do what you say. Sing your spirits breaking out. Come on. Your spirits breaking out. Your spirits breaking out. our hands before you and we tell you that this is the beginning 
we tell you that our young people will burn in revival. We tell you that we want revival, we pursue it, we are after awakening and nothing else will do. Now God, we have received today, but we don't leave what we received in the room, but we take it with us. So this week, if you're gonna pursue revival with me, I want you to give God a praise right now. Come on. Come on up, Pastor Dom. I want everybody to slip up your hands. If you want to stay and tarry in the altars, you can. But I just feel like these last two Sundays have been absolutely crucial and critical for where we are headed as a church. Our crowds have been bigger than ever. The hunger is at another level. Even after a three-hour service, to see hundreds of people still here. It tells me that revival is in the atmosphere. Can I get a witness? So Pastor Don, I want you to pray over us a prayer that seals it in the sense that we won't lose it, but also makes room for the more that God wants to do, okay? Heavenly Father, we don't want to lose what you have started in us. All the way back from January 1 through this whole time of prayer and fasting, Lord, you continue to fan the flame of this fire. And Lord, we don't want to let the fire go out. So I pray that even throughout this week, your fire will fall upon your people. I pray in their dreams, when they're driving down the road in their cars, when they're in their homes, they're trying to get ready. The Holy Spirit won't even let them get ready. They got to turn over to you, God, and begin to intercede and pray in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we release revival in this house. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would seal this work that you have done in our hearts today. And Lord, just let it increase and overflow this week. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching the message. I'm sure this spoke to you. Here's what I want you to do. Why don't you subscribe to this YouTube channel? That way, every time there's a new message, you'll get to hear it. Also, many of you have watched this. Some of you watch on a regular basis. Why not take time? And so, you can give at calvaryfl.com. You can give on your phones, and you can be a part of helping us take this message around the world, the message of hope the message of Jesus Christ. Can't wait to see you back here real soon.